Recording whenever you're ready, Try. All righty. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Sandcast. We are here once again for you on this great Wednesday. Uh, even though it's not Wednesday when we're recording, I like to uh, <laughs> say that. But uh, yeah, we have a special guest here today. We have uh, a ex-player, but also someone that's done a lot more than just play, which is why I'm so excited to have our guest on today. It is Gabby Reese. Gabby, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I, uh, I'm always interested to like talk volley, like be with volleyball players. It's so seldom now. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm like, yeah, okay. Yeah, well, I recently heard um, that you had April Ross. I don't know if the episode came out yet. Um, yeah, not yet. But I saw that you gave us a little teaser that you had April on. So, and I've heard you a lot, I think, I, on Rogan and I don't know, you, you know, your podcast and whatnot. And and it's rare that you actually are talking volley. So I was excited to get you on and I was excited to hear that you had uh, April on your show. Yeah, no, that was a real treat for me. Um, you know, obviously, like anyone who plays volleyball, I have a, a sort of a really deep and profound love for for the game of volleyball and what you know obviously the the fun of it and the competing but just also like really what it can do for someone's life yeah for sure you've been kind of out of the volleyball space for a little while though huh yeah a long time uh, the last time i played they were sort of making an attempt to bring fours back and i was pregnant five months pregnant and i i could i was still training not playing volleyball but i was fit enough that i was like <laughs> yeah okay because I really also loved that game yeah and so I was like if there would be any way um for that to happen so I that was sort of the last time I played and that was probably 12 or 13 years ago and um and you know uh I thought it would be a great feeder system but now you guys don't need it because they have doubles in at university right but mm -hmm. prior to that it was like either using fours which is good visually especially if you're going to be on tv because it's fast yeah however you could also use it a la elaine young's or nettie and jenny as a feeder for the doubles game because very few athletes unless they lived in southern california could come out and just get going you know holly mcpeak manhattan beach okay carrie walsh weird phenomenon and talent okay misty may grow up her whole life playing it's like so for me it was also part of that and i thought it would just also potentially bring even more attention to the game of beach volleyball but. yeah it, a force actually it has there's a little fire lit under it right getting now. a little resurgence <laughs> yeah because uh i mean well but there's the the boy these boys the mckibben brothers they're making a lot of content these days. they're kind of like uh leading us uh in terms of making content and whatnot they're doing a really good job and and they've done a few force events and what they're seeing is that people online they'll watch two or three times as many people will watch videos if it's force. And so they're actually, they just put it on a little tester event in Austin that we all went out to April, Taylor, the crabs, me, uh, you know, a, a lot of uh, really top level athletes. And um, we just had a blast. Like it was just so fun for us. The fans were engaged. There's something about fours that definitely is, is worth uh, mm -hmm. us keeping it alive for. Well, and I always said it could be a coming in or going out of a player's career. So if you were new, you could get indoctrinated through the sport, but also maybe if you were a little bit older, but you were sort of good enough at one of those positions, yeah. like let's say you were a mature setter, but you didn't want to be knocking around on the doubles tour anymore. If you could set, you had a, a game. I mean, obviously the middle part, some of those things are actually harder in a different way because you actually have to kind of put the ball away. But I, I sort of, saw it as it could also be bookends for players um potentially you know from doubles things like that that's it's a great call fun too though you know it's just like i think and again to your point it's it would be taking um an uneducated audience and they it makes it a little bit more spectator friendly and that's not a knock on um doubles or and and sixes maybe it's like is there too many people for the new person so right. is this weird, like, oh, it has that lifestyle thing that everybody loves about beach volleyball, but I, I sort of can figure out what's going on. Yeah. They even, they even did a um, snowball. That was fours, right, Travis? Yeah. Snow yeah. is threes. Oh, three. Oh, that was threes? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Grass is four, I think, right? 
I think uh, grass, it varies. There's so many different formats. I know that grass in uh, Wapaka's threes in Pottstown, it's two on two. Um, there, there's probably four is grass. Grass is picking up steam too. It's not, yeah. not for me either. I mean, no. if you want to get injured, go play some grass volleyball. Yeah. yeah. Oh if you really God. want to get injured, go play snow. Yeah. <laughs> it was a blast yeah. though. <laughs> I'll lose a finger if I, I, I just walked out of the water an hour ago and all my f fingers were white because it was so cold. Yeah. I can't play snow volleyball. Yeah. But Gabby, <laughs> you're probably in a, a pretty rare classification of people who played professionally in volleyball <laughs> in two on two on the beach in fours. And you had a, a pretty good career indoor as well. You did a little bit of everything. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a few of us, I think, um, you know, listen, if I can be really honest, I fell completely into playing volleyball at every level. I played a little bit when I lived in the Virgin Islands. And then when I moved to Florida, my junior year of high school, because I was 6'3 and 15, um, you know, they sort of direct you to like, you'll be playing volleyball and basketball for the school. And I, I remember so clearly feeling um, in the way and like, I didn't want to you know, make mistakes or, you know, get in people's way and things like that. And, and so when I was given offers to go play in college, uh, it was a, a real surprise to me. And then even when my freshman year of Florida state, because there was, um, eight freshmen on a 12 girl roster, wow. we had to play. So there was another, there was sort of like a different level of responsibility. It was like two freshmen coming in. It was like, well, you'll get to play next year when the senior medals leave. It was like, no, you better get it together because we need you to play, which was a great thing. Um, but I, I sort of learned how to play volleyball in college. And, um, and then I was working. So it was like a pretty interesting time. But then when I came to the beach, I came out to play doubles. And Holly McPeak was actually generous enough to, I played against her um, in an NCAA tournament I, in college, and she was kind enough to let me be a practice dummy for her. And some of, and, she, and by then she was already, you know, it was like her rookie season, maybe her second season. And she was, you know, sort of good, great coming out of the, the gates. And out of that, um, I ended up getting drafted into the fours, which really was good for me because it, I could just get, more opportunities and more repetition and more time really competing and playing at a high level sooner than that would have had I would have been you know one or two or three and out um in yeah. doubles probably for a couple of years yeah so you were it was a draft for fours oh yeah we were serious oh that's <laughs> awesome <laughs> I didn't know that it was a draft I can't even believe the stuff that went on because in my second year I was a <laughs> captain and so then you'd be like talking to other captains and who was getting first pick and what were they going to be getting? Oh, wow. Um, and, you know, yeah, no. It, and you'd have to go, you would go. I remember going to state beach and there'd be a, a group. You'd have girls that if you said, Hey, if you want to play fours, this is your time to show what you've got, you know, you're made of. And I'll never forget actually Katie Eldridge, who was a really a great player. I played with for many years, a uh, right sider. And she, um, she played at Cal Poly very unassuming girl right and I was leaving state beach and for some reason somebody talked to me and I turned and in that moment behind them I could see her and she hit this ball that was so heavy and I remember thinking oh I didn't see her and so it was really cool you would go and just see all these players and try to piecemeal a team together and like my rookie year is a as a as a captain because I brought Nike in I finagled I actually wrote a handwritten out um, note to Phil uh, Knight and said will you buy a team so I can have a team because otherwise it's an inch and a half inch and a half logo restriction right if it's another team with your logo right so huh. I wrote a note and said hey if you buy the team I can swish it out and it's not going to cost you a bunch of money but I was like imposter rookie Karen Kemner um, Tara Cross Battle and uh, Leanne Sato, I drafted. And I, I don't know if you're familiar with any of those women, but Karen Kemner at the time was the best indoor player in the world. Okay. And she was a left side player who didn't have a lot of experience on the beach. And uh, these were very badass indoor USA volleyball players. They were not really beach players except for Sato. And, um, you know, I was like, okay, here's your uniform. And if you feel like it, practice at 2.30 would seem like a good time, you know? Yeah. Like, <laughs> um, and, and, and what was interesting is in some, like with Karen, just because I have more experience, I was a better beach player than her. 
but she was the best indoor player in the world, right? So it was such a, it was just a very, it was a really incredible learning curve where you're the captain, but are you really? And, you know, it's all that. <laughs> right. <laughs> Interesting. And then the drama of the people that you didn't pick being on the other side of the net later. Oh yeah. Or your old teammates that you wanted, but you couldn't hold on to your whole team, right? You had to release two players every season. So you would wow. hope that you'd be like, okay, I'm going to release the people I think I can get back up again. And then when they would be picked up by somebody, like I had a setter, Stephanie Cox, um, she played at UC Santa Barbara and she was a great setter and we had a great chemistry. And then, um, you know, Kim Odin, I mean, like, you know, she picked her up and I remember being really pissed and like, it was all this stuff. And then I had to play against, it was just a very interesting thing. And that was the other, that was the only bummer and it was fair, but you couldn't hold on to all your players every year. So interesting. I didn't know like any of this stuff about the force. I, I knew that the force tour existed. Um, Cause I remember when I was talking to Sinjin about how he ended up partnering with Carl Henkel for the Olympics, he just plucked him off the four man tour because none of the AVP guys could play FIVB. And so I knew it was there and I knew it was amazing, but I didn't realize that there were drafts and like he had to release players and all this stuff. There were some interesting and kind of fun strategic parts of it. And then yeah. we had big conversations around who would the two alternate players that you would travel. So the, the league would travel everybody. You never paid for anything. You would okay. never be out money. And even if you lost and you were last place, everybody went home with money. And that was sort of interesting. But you also had to travel and pay two alternative players. So all the captains had agree had to agree upon who was this going to be? Because if you lost your middle, what did that look like? If it lost your setter, what did it look like? So you had to have these players that could kind of fit in somewhere. And um, and also the men, you know, they were really big and exciting to watch. Um, the women's TV ratings were higher. So we were actually paid more. <laughs> Oh, that's interesting. Because really in, we were on ESPN two, I think, or ESPN, and so it was. It was just really. Um, it was a lot of fun, and it was a grind, like volleyball is. Um, but I, it was, yeah, it's it's a really. It was it was a great way to get involved, and then that tour went away, and I played doubles for a bit, and and uh, I play. I had great partners. I played with Holly and um, a player, Linda Hanley, who's incredible, and I think. You know, for me, it was, I was always looking at the, the platform itself. And I, I kind of, I remember I went to Switzerland and met with Ruben Acosta, who at the time was the head of the FIVB. It's mm -hmm. like a mafia. And I went and I had a meeting with him to try to say, hey, was there a way to get fours? And he said, we had, you know, the fact that we got doubles in the Olympics, we can't actually have a competing product. And so I think that that's why it was hard to, to get that discipline. And, and then with doubles, I just, was you know sort of like okay how much time am I going to have to invest in this and I had other things that I was also trying to do and so that was a that was an interesting and hard decision for me because like I said I really fell into the game and I've used this analogy a lot Carrie Walsh you know from the beginning was sort of groomed to be a winner yeah probably yeah. by the time she was in eighth grade she's like I'm a winner. <laughs> I went at this level I went at the next level it just and um, <clears throat> for me, the sport was, um, it like really kind of saved my life. You know, it got me to university. My coach at college, uh, Cecile Renaud, um, impacted me in a really profound way. And it just in, like taught me about life, like the, real, the way coaches are really supposed to. Like they're yes. supposed to kick your ass and teach you a sport, but they're supposed to teach you about like being a stand up, you know, citizen. And, um, and so, and just the relationships and, and kind of uh, the lifestyle of, of taking care of yourself and working hard and, and learning, you know, I think if you said to me, why could I play the game so quickly late? It's really, cause I'm probably just coachable. Um, so I had great coaches in, in Gary Sato and Mangus and some other guys. Um, uh, so volleyball was something else for me. I don't think it was just about accumulating like wins and like, it was something sort of in a different way, um, that, like what it did for me as a human being. Right. That's awesome. I, I, I love that hearing that just because we talk a lot about on the show, like about how people get stuck in the pipeline. Like if you're playing, you have to be winning. You have to be playing. You know, you have to go to these events and do this and do that and do that. And they all kind of go down the same path. But it 
really the path is really only built for certain people not just the winning part but just like who you are as a person like not everyone's built for traveling on the world tour um or you know avp or whatever it might be um but i love hearing like that you had so much success uh just kind of going about it in your own way and i think i kind of want to like encourage everyone to do that obviously you have to try to make a living um but you got to find your own uh what do you call it the, the blue ocean right like your your unique path through the the journey in volleyball well and also i think there's there's other parts of this that are really important to identify which is especially if you have a person who've, who's done this since they were very young we get wrapped up as this is our identity right and mm -hmm. um it's it's natural it's like oh i do this i'm good at this oh you're the volleyball player and i think the problem is is that there's also so much life after volleyball that you don't want people to be done with something that that probably was actually very positive and then it be sort of disappointing right. or sad um, versus, you know, I did the best I could. I worked really hard when I had the opportunity. I went for it. I'm a stronger uh, person for it. And I can also I tell all athletes this because, you know, Laird and I see a lot of athletes. You know, a good example would be like a college football player, all American could, could go to the pros, but we know how hard that is, right? 1% of college athletes play professionally and their knees hurt and it just didn't happen. And I'm like, the thing is about athletes is you're a loaded gun. You just have to figure out what's your next bullseye and not be defined by, you know, like even Laird, who I don't know of an athlete more intertwined in their sport than him. He's like, yes, but I'm not a surfer. I'm Laird. And one of the things I do is surf, right? Mm. And so I would say to players, uh, don't imitate people, right? But also when you're doing the sport, don't wait until you're done to figure out what are you going to do next. And that's a very hard thing to do because it takes so much energy and effort to play that game well at that level. I mean, I used to joke that I spent 90% of my time training and playing volleyball and 3% of my income at that time or 5% of my income came from beach volleyball. I was like doing all these other things to try to make it happen. And so the, the thing is, is to look up once in a while mm -hmm. and like, look at the horizon and be like, well, who do I think I'm becoming? What's, what's calling me? What interests me? Because the other thing is people will help you more weirdly when you're in it. Like if you want to seek out a mentor or do something in your off season, people are more apt to help you when you're actually doing it. Then when you go, hey, I just retired from it, somehow that makes it harder. And so it's like be all in it and then, you know, keep asking yourself who you, who you are and the other things so that when you do have to transition and even if it's like, OK, I'm a coach now for volleyball. Cool, whatever, um, that it's not so difficult because that I think is the one of the downside of sport, which is like man, it was so good and magical. And I learned all these things. And in certain ways, it's really kicking my ass, you know? Yeah. That's a, it's such a valuable big picture to have, but it's also one that's really difficult to have when you're in it that, cause you don't really ever imagine that it's going to end, right? Or you might understand that it will end, but it's never as soon as you think. Um, and you've made the transition from volleyball to post volleyball, I, like wildly successfully. When did you start to have that sort of bigger picture did you have it while you were a player or was it when you stopped and you were like oh shit <laughs> i gotta figure some things out i actually think that's probably why i left the game early because when i was in college i started working in fashion and and the reason i started modeling was and i actually gave up my scholarship after my sophomore year and i paid to play because of the ncaa rules at that time were very strict sure. um, because i was taking care of myself i I wasn't, my bills were not paid for by anyone else. So, um, you know, after my sophomore year at 18, I gave up my scholarship because I thought, okay, I'm going to take a gamble on this other thing to make a living. It wasn't like I dreamed to do that. I understood it's a job. You travel, there's an education in that. It's a whole other business that you can learn. Cool. So then once I turned professional, I sort of took some of the things that I learned from that about communication and image and all these things and tried to bring that over to volleyball. 
Um, it's like I always tell athletes to play beach volleyball. It sounds weird when you're being interviewed on camera, take your sunglasses off because otherwise you just look like everybody else. And I, and I want to know you. I'm a fan. I want to get invested in you. I want to see you. I want to. So when you play now, I'm really like, oh, there's my guy or my girl, you know, um, and also learn to articulate your experience that transcends the sport itself. Articulate what you're experiencing as a human being, because then the audience will be like, I felt like that. I've never played beach volleyball, but I understand what they're talking about. And just so I think I. <clears throat> that when I was playing volleyball and then I started doing other things I mean I think I was shooting MTV sports by the time I was 23 doing stuff like one day before um on a down day no practice and then uh before making it to some other town for a tournament on the weekend kind of thing so I was always kind of doing other things because I understood the limitations of unfortunately our platform and um and so I think that certainly made it easier, for sure. Yeah. You, you seem to have a pretty entrepreneurial spirit. I mean, just looking at all the different things that you've done, you were a volleyball player, you've been an actress, you have your own podcast, you do all these different things. Have you always been sort of wired like that to kind of carve out your own path? Yeah, I think it's called fear. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, like everybody... It's interesting what a good chip on your shoulder or like no safety net can do for a person. The yeah. hope is just as you get older that you do it for better reasons for, you know, it's like you get rid, you maybe can offload that, that narrative and, yeah. and, and uh, do it, but certainly in the beginning. And it was a kind of understanding, like seeing things and thinking, I think I could do that pretty well. And other things being like, yeah, that's definitely not me. Um, I think I was always in, in touch with that early and, and, and quite frankly, I prefer the business side of things, like whether it's like XPT or Laird Superfood, where a lot of the times I'm heavily involved daily, but I enjoy kind of the, all the business elements of it and not, it, and it not being in front. That's why I like the podcast. Maybe you guys experienced this. I've always enjoyed um, sort of highlighting other people or learning from them and, um, and sort of digging in and, 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 you know, asking questions. Yeah, we always, me and Try always talk about that the podcast feels like like a life cheat code that we just get to talk to all these amazing people and pick their brains and just have a conversation and learn from them. And we're like, oh, we get, and then people tell us, thank you for doing it. We're like, well, we, this is the greatest job in the world. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you on that. Because <laughs> learning, right? I think that's one of the fundamentals. That's why people really love sport is if you have this idea of like being improving, continuing to find a way to improve in your life, I think that's, um, that turns a lot of people on for sure. Yeah. When you moved to, um, the mainland, cause you grew up on the Virgin islands, um, which I, you're the first person I've met who's grown up on the Virgin islands. Um, you mentioned that when you moved there, you were six foot three and you, you obviously assimilated onto the volleyball team pretty well. Did you have an athletic background prior to that? Like, what was life like on the Virgin Islands growing up? Yeah, I mean, listen, probably what you would think. Um, I There was, you know, days hanging out at the beach, probably some ruckus from like age 13 to 15, because, you know, you have carnival, you have, um, you know, most of the people, it's like, why are parents down there in the first place like they're out of their minds you know <laughs> I mean? like it's not like they're like oh we're gonna go set up it's like so you have probably some free willing kids but I did play a little bit of volleyball okay and um in fact I remember one year um I was in a league that was all women they could eat me for lunch I was the <laughs> only white girl in the entire league they used to joke and like touch my hair and everything and I but I think that's where I really fell in love with the game because they were really tough women. Um, and I was terrible, but there was something about it and the coach, and I wish I could find him. He's in Chicago. His name was Kenny. And like he, I would have to drive with him and his, sometimes his family to go to the practice. Cause that's how I could get there. And, um, and yeah, so I think that was like my first taste of it, but I really was not going in any direction there. Yeah. There was yeah. never the idea of anything after high school. Okay. Never. Like I never thought, oh, uh, college. You th you thought, oh, you just get a regular job. Like you work at a gift shop or something. Yeah. 
And then my junior year, my mom brought me to St. Petersburg, Florida. So there's a lot more structure. Um, so, you know, I think it was really good to grow up there. And also my, my father, um, who passed away when I was five was grew up and raised in Trinidad. So I have an entire side of my family that's West Indian. So it also, whether I understood it or not, was a way for me to kind of connect with that, with my dad's culture, because culturally it's very similar. Yeah. And, yeah. um, and so that, I think that, and there's something grounding and if people go, okay, how you and Laird, you're, you're both athletic and blonde. What unites Laird and I is we're from islands, mm -hmm. our values, the way we see the world, it's because we come from islands. And so I'm, I'm so grateful for that, but I think I needed to leave right when I did, because I'm sure you understand you could get stuck there. Yeah. And I think the thing about growing up on an island is be grounded in the values of what an island is and humility and all of these things about what's really important, but then go into the world and, and see, dream, make a life, uh, whatever. And, if, and, I, and for me, the ultimate was like, when I go back to Kauai, that I, I have this life that I can bring back there. Um, that seems to be kind of the best of all worlds. Yeah, that's definitely something that I, I guess, wrestle with a lot is like, I'm, I'm Hawaii boy through and through. And I, I identify with that 100%. I haven't even been there. I haven't lived there full time since I went to college in 2007. Um, but like, everyone's like, where are you from? I'm like, Hawaii, you know, even though I've been here for so long. Um, but yeah, the opportunity, like as much as I, I wish I still live there and, and I want to be there full time, the opportunities out here, I started a family out here uh, and I definitely wrestle with it. It's hard for me to live in a big city where I don't have that um, sense of community and that culture. And uh, so I'm, I'm trying to do the Gabby and Laird where where I have uh, my house in Hawaii and in California. Obviously, <laughs> I got to work myself up there. But well, you guys have it. You, you live 10 minutes from each other. I think, you know, the thing is, is West Indian culture is one thing. Polynesian culture is a whole other situation. And the, mm -hmm. the lessons, right, of, I think, of a Polynesian. I have a, a theory that mm -hmm. the, the West Indians were brought to the Virgin Islands. The Polynesians sailed to Hawaii. Right. And so the, your starting point is already a differentiating point. Uh -huh very different and you know sort of the soul and you know family element of the polynesian culture that you grew up with you can recreate that as you know in your own you know connections and it's like if somebody asks you for help you would help them it's like right. you know, all the all those great things are i always laugh at like it's loving and they don't take themselves very seriously but yet it is a warrior culture so like okay take it easy like you know okay flip the switch quick <laughs> you know don't stare just like be cool you know um so i think it's i think it would be important of something to keep alive within yourself because it was a gift to you that you got to even go there um yeah. and, you know and experience what that is larry has that too like they'll be like oh, are you american he's like no i'm from hawaii <laughs> and, uh, like, yeah no it's different right and so, uh, yeah and he always said you know i i look white but i i think brown you know and uh and so it's a really beautiful uh, gift that you have that in there, you know, inside. Yeah. I'm the white boy with uh, the giant Polynesian tattoo on my leg. <laughs> <laughs> it confuses people, but, but for me, I get it. <laughs> That's all that matters. Yeah, exactly. You mentioned uh, that, you know, fear was kind of a motivator for a lot of the entrepreneurial things you've done and that you had this chip on your shoulder and that eventually it, it goes away. Um, at what point did you feel that that chip sort of uh, started to dissolve a little bit, or maybe it, it's still there a little bit? Because I feel like with athletes, there's always a little bit of something there. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I'm not competitive in that way. I mean, I always wanted to do my best and I was mm -hmm. competitive with myself. Um, I, I'd say probably once you maybe when you start having kids or, you, and I don't want to say when you grow up a little bit, but I think when you look at yourself, take a long look at yourself over and over and kind of go, you know, what if this is productive and enhancing my life? And what if this is sort of like, I should start to maybe offload some of it. I heard, I had somebody who helped me once 
I was going through something with my middle daughter when she was a teenage, a younger teenager. Uh, she's 18 now and, and thriving, but it was pretty difficult. And the way that I function, this kid hates, right? Like super disciplined, you know, uh, let me, like, I think about all my feelings, like it's all dum dum dum, you know, and, and uh, she's very empathetic and feeling and all these things. Anyway, the woman said to me, you know, you use a hammer your whole life. Like, it's great. Like a hammer down, hammer through, hammer, you know, and she's like, but you know, it's like, when you're talking about nuance and relationships and other things, like it, when it's time to wash the windows, like you need a new tool. And so I think for all of us, um, what happens, the dangerous part is you, is if we're actually successful using the sort of way that we do it, um, when do we say this works in its place and now I need you to learn new skills and do it differently. So I think, um, you know, there's a ton of athletes that um, can adapt and then there's, there's some that can't. And I just think that's based on the individual person. And, uh, you know, it's like when people go, well, that's just the way I do it. It's like, is, it, is that how it ends? Like, that's just how you do it. You know? like, okay. So I think um, for me, and it makes it easier. I think I live with somebody who has this sort of attitude of uh, an openness. I think Laird being around the ocean weirdly has a malleability that uh, is a good influence on me. Cause you're, what are you going to do? Like, no, this, how, this, I'm taking this line and the waves like, yeah, no idiot. That's not <laughs> taking that line, but, you know, it's like, so I think it's like, you're always adapting and being like, oh, this is opened up for me. I'm going to go here and do this, or this would be appropriate in this situation. So I think it's, it's also kind of staying open and not being afraid of being a beginner or not knowing or feeling uncomfortable because then I think that's when you can really kick some real ass. Yeah. The, the beginner's mindset, I feel like that's something that's starting to catch on just in vogue really is that everyone's starting to sort of espouse that. Just if you look at everything as if you are a beginner, like you're not just a hammer and everything isn't a nail. Maybe sometimes you need the, the cloth to wipe the windshield or whatever it may be. It's yeah. a super valuable skill. Yeah. But I also think simultaneously, if we move through culturally, I think that there's some things that I really hope that we don't lose, which is a gr some kind of grinding mentality. I think people are, at times it feels like, and I even, I mean, listen, I have children, but it's like, how do we keep nuance and, you know, sort of polite disagreement alive discussion? How do we keep like, at some point, somebody has to make a decision and, and not everybody has to agree. Like if you're in sports, or business or military, it's like, not everyone's gonna be happy. Like it's, that's how it is. Life is unfair. Like, so I, I'm, I hope that we don't lose all of that where everyone gets sort of paralyzed by like, well, I wanna tell you how I feel. And it's like, okay, but at some point we have to pull the trigger and like, this is just the way it is. So I think for me within that is also um, the things I have learned from sport, which is like, deal with it, you know? And, and, you know, suck it up, if you will. And, and I don't mean suck it up in this, in things where it's like things that should be talked about or corrected. I'm talking about like, this is hard. I'm uncomfortable. It's unfair. Like some of it, it's like, yep. That's how it is. <laughs> I love that. You got me like thinking ahead, like 15 years. Cause my girl, my daughter's two now. I'm like, oh God, what yeah. is coming down the pipeline? <laughs> what tools do I have to get out? <laughs> well, you want to teach them. I think you guys will have an advantage that over we had as parents. You will teach your children how to manage, hopefully, their um, artificial life, their yeah. electronic life. I think for us, we didn't see it coming as much. And before we knew it, it was like, wait, what? Like, what is going on? And like, how much time is spent on this? And how is this impacting it? And, you know, so I think it's, it, I, I really envy all parents that, having to navigate that. I think you guys live in great communities, most likely just the nature of where you live will encourage your daughter to be active. Yeah, no, for sure. But it's all right. It's already getting to an interesting point where I'm having to like check myself. And for example, my daughter's calling me try now. <laughs> she's two and i'm and like normally like it's especially so from hawaii you know how it is in hawaii like 
auntie we're, we're going there in a week yeah and and it's like very respect your elders kind of thing but then i'm like try she's two she has no idea she just wants to copy her mom but i keep being like don't call me try you know I, I i want to but i'm like holding back like <laughs> don't say anything <laughs> yeah you know that's the other thing you know the expression that in which we per, you know resist persists i think in parenting uh, my daughters go through phases, you know, like, is it a style phase? Is it a nail phase? Is it something, right? And I have really learned my lesson, um, unless it's something that's going to hurt them. Uh, right. You're like, oh, <laughs> yeah, they're in that phase. And they, you don't say anything. They do move through it. It's an incredible study of they get through it quicker. Um, I think with girls, I mean, with all children, but with girls, it's so important just as, especially as they get older, just to to be able to listen, mm. you know, and, uh, and not fix it. I know, especially dads want to fix everything and solve everything. If you have a kid that's actually coming and sharing things with you, it's be like, Oh, uh-huh. Oh, I could see that. That's tough. And as they get older, you can even throw in a ninja move. Like, can I ask a question? <laughs> <laughs> and they'll tell you because what you realize is if you have the gift of your kid coming to you and sharing, that's what you want. Right. Even if secretly inside you're like, I don't want to hear this. Because <laughs> there's stuff you say, you're just like, oh, you know, it's like I call it the, the steering wheel gripper. You're like, oh, huh? Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Talking. Right. They're talking. Because we didn't, you know, we think, especially athletes, right? Like, or to make a CEO, it's like, well, wait a second, I didn't plan this. This is not part of the plan. And uh, that's what your kids are. Believe me, that's what they're there for because they are <laughs> there to teach you. Yeah. Uh, that we're listen. You're you're not. Uh, you can be in charge, but you're you're definitely not in control. Right. Yeah. It's that's crazy to think about. But I for me, I'm like, okay, I I can be hands off. I'll just try to surround her with like good community, good people, volleyball community, Hawaii, and I think she should be able to navigate herself to a good life through that rather than like me trying to steer it. Cause I don't think that'll work. <laughs> well, and also it's, it's like, I tell my girls, I'm not your coach. I'm your mom. Right. You know? And that's not my job. My job is to talk to you about you as a human being and your feelings and how you're conducting yourself, your values, your relationships. Um, you know, that's my job. And I'll be honest, there are days that I really do wish I'd push my kids more. Um, but I also know how hard it is. So there, I believe there has to be a calling too. And yeah. there are plenty of athletes, a la Andre Agassi, who say, yes, okay, I did it and I was good at it, but also I wasn't happy. Yeah. So as their mom or dad, um, that's kind of antithetical of what our job is. Yeah. I like that. I reread uh, Agassiz's book this year. And it is so good. I'm sure. I mean, I'm sure you've read it, Gabby. Yeah, yeah, it's good, but it's a good, it's a great reminder too. What you know that whole thing about like what is success? What do we define as success? Yeah, we all know a lot of champions that um, you know they're great at what they did or do, but does that what is that? What do we define um, yeah. as successful? And I think. Um, that's and it's the quiet stuff right like people who are like oh they won and they got a lot of money or they have a fancy job title but actually for me as a parent I feel like it's the it's that quiet it's like oh that kid has a lot of friends or they can set goals and achieve them they can solve problems they can adapt they can express their needs and wants that's not sexy but I don't know like for me that is a real part of success yeah. I, I feel like you mentioned it might not be sexy. I feel like the, the most, the sexiest things in life are just the ones that aren't the most fulfilling, like the most fulfilling aspects. You know, it's, it's not necessarily like winning is great. Like winning Manhattan for you try was great, but I feel like the most fulfilling part is the fact that you get up every day and you either, you drive to McKell's or you go practice with Jose and you do it all. And you're a dad in between and like all of that led up to the win. And while the sexy part is getting your name on the pier, that was really just, a 45 minute match in between all of the fulfilling stuff that was in between. It's weird. I feel like now that I've achieved certain things in my career that I maybe thought I didn't know that I could ever do, 
now I'm getting to these points. I'm like, that's, this isn't, uh, it's not like getting to the mountaintop and having like this giant celebration. It's like, so it's just great forever. You know, the, the fulfilling part is having that thing that you're going for. Mm. And like knowing that I have something rather than like, now my name's literally on the pier and I'm, and I walk out there, I'm like, it's sweet, but like, I don't really like feel like telling people about it or like, you know, I, I can't hang my ha hat on it. I have it. It's there, yeah. but I got to move on. Like it's not fulfilling me at all. Like I got to move on to another, uh, you know, goal or something. You well, just pull in random people. You're like, Hey, look at the, look at my name. Look at that. <laughs> yeah. It, it'd be nice if I was like single back in my college and I take a girl <laughs> on a date and walk over. Oh, Oh yeah. The, that's there. Whoops. <laughs> Right, because then there's a real purpose for that, right? Right, then there's, then there's <laughs> I think, you know, I think that's a really important point because I think people, um, but, but striving and who you have to be in order to do that is the thing, right? Like winning is, is feels so good because it's also an indication that you did the right things. Mm. Your preparation was correct, your thoughts, your instincts, all that. Um, but there, but actually who you have to be to be that discipline, to work that hard, to grind it out. That is the thing that is the, the, that lasts all the time, mm. you know, cause next year they'll be like, we're going to defend your title. Oh, they won. What about you? It's just right. like, that, you know, stuff. And, um, Laird, Laird said there was a quote from a Navy SEAL that said like, uh, what was it? Uh, never let your, um, accomplishments be greater than your dreams right so it's sort of like this idea um because then you're free if we hold on to it's like really sad guys who talk about their glory days in high school football it's like dude right like, um, yeah and yeah. actually you know in the end it's like your life so you know what is the thing that want, you want to do not everyone goes hey good job mm, yeah and Part what are uh, what are the the dreams left for for you right now i mean you've you've accomplished a considerable amount in life um and you're currently raising uh an, another daughter uh through a, a interesting phase of life the teenage phase um but what are you kind of looking to do and, and accomplish i think what i'm always looking to do is make sure that my family's in good shape um that is that's a really important thing for me and and when i say that just that there's a there's some level of connection and that everyone, you know, I don't know if you guys experience this, like, you're, you know, in your home and like everyone's asleep and safe and inside the house, they're sort of like, okay, we're good. Yeah. Um, and obviously my kids are in the world, but um, that's always important. Um, you know, my podcast is important uh, to me because I enjoy the communication. Um, but right now, the other thing I'm really focused on is our, our food business. You know, we took that public uh, last September and, um, you know, there's a lot of lessons in that. Like now you're on the, you know, New York Stock Exchange and you're getting your ass kicked by Wall Street and you have a board that you're contending with. And so there's a whole new set of uh, lessons. And so my focus um, is to really be a part of this company going over a few more uh, kind of markers of, uh, of expansion for well, sure. Like you have just like such a wealth of experience in so many different industries, just from writing to podcasting, TV, you're an athlete. Um, and then you took a, a company public and which is, is it Laird Superfood? Is that just the, okay. I have, yeah. I've had the creamer actually try when I stayed at Spencer McLaughlin's place. And I, uh, I got the performance mushroom yeah. and the creamer. <laughs> yeah. I made sure for this podcast that I have. I'll send you guys um, care packages because we have a lot of other, things yeah no yeah, I, I, we got yeah. very lucky it was Laird and uh, our CEO and myself and then you know that things went well and then we, you know you bring on the really smart people that know what they're doing and and uh and that's helpful but it's yeah it's constant it's a constant learning and I always say there's time you know a lot of times I'm working for people in the company uh because it's it, you know there's so many things you don't understand or know yeah yeah I think I was, it's one. Sorry. Go ahead, Jack. You got me. Uh, uh, when uh, when I'm thinking, like I'm hearing your guys' story, you and Laird, um, I I think about a lot. Like when I'm 
thinking about myself or people in my sport well first of all it's a it's a huge female sport in general and gen- and i don't know as a global community there's always been this like you know the moms kind of take the back seat in terms of career and have the kids and all that um mm-hmm. but i think a lot of you know we've had a lot of females have babies recently mm-hmm. and come back from that and and start playing and I just feel like um, you and Laird have done such a good job of balancing two people's success while also keeping family a priority. And that's the same for me right now. I'm trying to, I'm trying to, we really want um, Gabby to be able to focus on her acting, my wife on her acting as much as me in volleyball, but now we have a kid. So none of that is the priority. Uh, But like, how do do you guys balance all that and business and everything? Mm -hmm. You know, it's an interesting thing. It's um, it's also like which thing needs what attention when, right? It's not everything all at once, every moment. And by the way, like when I first met Laird, um, I would say that Laird is by far and always has been way better at his sport than I ever was at my sport. Um, but when we met in the outside world, I had a, a sort of a lot more attention or whatever right. success. Um, and then I was doing that and Laird was on his quest um and then when i started having children laird's career really took off in the external way um because people have to realize like you can be really good at something that and that doesn't it is not diminished by the fact that the rest of the world doesn't understand or know or isn't caught on to right right right, yeah Uh, so but he he was so it was like okay i have a biological responsibility like i'm nursing and i'm doing this and can't and (laughs) <laughs> also your trajectory there, you know, everybody's careers have these flows. And, um, and so it was like, okay, we're going to put the juice behind that. And mm-hmm. I'm going to be supporting him and, and my family. And then I could, and then maybe I would have opportunity. So it was what, when, and it was, and for me, it was like, okay, I understand. I can't pour gas on my fire right now. I'm not in no position. Even if somebody said, Hey, you want to go work 10 hours a day? I wouldn't have left um, the girls. So it was understanding what needed to be done when, when it's even time that your relationship needs. I would say that both of us have been very diligent about self-care. Even for me, if the ki- if my kids were babies, brand new, even if it was like 20 minutes, 30 minutes, I always found a play, a way to train and, and also the relationship as hard as that can be, because it, it's an easy thing to go by the wayside. And sometimes being new parents, it's like not particularly sexy. People are tired, yeah. you know, diapers, wet, you know, whatever it's, it <laughs> is what it is. Right. Um, you got to take care of that because it is also part of the platform that you're bringing this, these children onto. Mm. And um, they're always first, but in the way that is healthy where they're a part of the family, they're not the center of the family. Mm. And, um, but yeah, listen, it's a dance and you, and you, and maybe it's thinking, am I committed to this? I am. So how do I make this as, as sort of as fluid and positive and solution oriented as I possibly can, instead of bitching and moaning that I'm tired or it's this or it's that. It's like being really clear, like, Hey, I need this. Or can we connect here instead of circling the bowl on what the problems are, what are the solutions? And for Mm -hmm. men, I would say what's really important, especially if you have a young, young children is to love your partner. I always tell Laird, I'll do everything a wife does for you. Everything I cook for Laird. I have no, I, I, it is my joy to do it because Laird serves the family in his way. Do not treat me like your wife. Treat me like your girlfriend. Hmm. Because if I feel like an old hat that's just kind of there that Laird isn't like excited about or whatever, there's a part of me, especially when you have a little kid that you're like, F this, I did not sign up for this. Right. So if a guy can just, you know, if we can make each other feel special and appreciated, yeah. little, hey, thanks, I really appreciate you or whatever. I think that this is really, and it's hard to do because we get accustomed to each other and we're in automatic gear and we're tired and we're busy and all these things. Um, so it's important to, if we can have the discipline, cause it is the perspective of, of what you really value 
and uh, about your partner and and um and move towards the solutions and and be proactive in in uh, not letting stuff go too far if you can help it right that's super valuable i'm i'm in the middle of all that stuff just kind of <laughs> learning it all as we go hopefully that's uh relevant for I'm, I'm guessing it's relevant for a lot of uh um players especially on the beach because it's uh a lot of players are older nowadays like playing into their 40s and having kids and coming back and being successful and whatnot yeah and uh, for the females listen it's an ass kicker you always feel guilty um you know it's it's you're constantly trying to you know, do I do too much? Am I not doing enough? It's all that. And I don't know if there's any way to avoid that as a parent is that constant, like being a feeling unsure. It's really, it's, it's natural and it's okay, Mm. but you just have to maybe keep learning and trying. And that's why I, one uh, Byron Katie, who does a program called the work said to me once, Some of the best things you could do for your children are listen, don't, you know, don't change, don't fix it. Try your best. Nobody's happy, but like make yourself pretty happy because then they know what it looks like. You're modeling Mm. for that. And, you know, if something goes up or your kid says something, a powerful thing, if you have a kid that's like, oh, you da da da, you can be like, okay, I can take a look at that. That simple gesture to a to showing your kid, I'm not saying giving them the keys to the car or the reins, because that's a disaster. <laughs> but being like, even though I'm your parent, I'm going to be humble enough to hear what you're saying and say, okay, I'll take a look at that. Right. Um, but yeah, listen, in this crazy world where we're, not, we're living in a way that we're not probably supposed to be, we were supposed to like be home, you know, you work you know, how far from your house before you only lived to you were barely 50. I mean, you know, we weren't like, yeah, we're, it's complicated. Yeah, for sure. We're working literally all over the entire planet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So wild. Yeah. And it's, and one thing too, is like, if you're on the road and you know, your wife is at home with your two-year-old and it's hard, the last thing you want, you don't want it. You want to try to avoid is like Laird does this to me sometimes. He'll t- we'll talk about 50 things that are like on my plate that he also will put on my plate when he's mm-hmm. off chasing surf, You're which right. is your job. Beach volleyball is your job. Yeah. And sometimes it's confusing because people are like, You're playing a game and like he's surfing. It's like, No, that's their job. Right. Um, good job. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I'll be like, Are you okay? It's like, Are you serious right now? Like, <laughs> don't do that. Like, somehow make those interactions on the phones really good okay got you yeah yeah no definitely how was your day how are you holding up um hey i really appreciate you i miss you guys you know yeah it's like olympics time uh i just like i'm gone and i forget that like she's literally dealing with everything else yeah plus watching her husband play in the olympics (laughs) which is stressful in itself I was on the road for about five straight months this year, Gabby. So I, I've taken a lot of notes here. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do that. You know, what's weird is unless like, I know if something important is going to, is supposed to be coming in. If I can't give Laird my full attention, if I'm traveling with work, I don't even answer the call. Yeah. Because I mean, I've been with Laird 26 years and I have so much respect for him. And maybe I always joke like a splash of reverence because Laird's very intense. Yeah. <laughs> That like, unless I can be like focused on him, I don't go like, yeah, oh yeah, okay, I'm in Brazil. It's all, you know, it's like, it's like, unless I know maybe he, there's something serious happening. I don't until it's like, okay, I'm focused on you. Yeah. Too many of those kind of piecemealed calls or interactions. Yeah. And I think that's worse than less. And then when you do, boom. Yeah. What, I mean, what if we approach like all of our life like that? I'm just going to do this and I'm just going to dial in and not going to get distracted by Instagram and whatever other gadget we have. We're like, all right, I'm here and here's my attention. I feel like we'd just be so much more effective doing one thing at one time than trying to do 32 different things at the same time. My husband is very much like that. So like when Laird looks at you to talk to you, I mean, I need 30 seconds with Laird. I'm good. Like, (laughs) I love you. And I'm like, I'm good. (laughs) 
looking at his phone being like, love you, babe. You know, it's like yeah, right. it's so intense. And um, I've learned a lot from that because I can multitask and be in my brain and be like all over the place inside. And I've learned like, just even with the kids, right? I'm looking at you. I always say to my girls too, like I take the phone, they go, hey, can I ask a question? I put my phone down, I'm listening. Yeah. I think acknowledgement and that lean in will get you far, especially <laughs> in your interpersonal relationships. Yeah. How much of that do you think is due to what Laird does for a living in that if he's big wave surfing and he's distracted for half a second, I mean, the consequences are pretty catastrophic. And we had um, Michael Gervais on the podcast a couple of weeks ago, and he was talking about why he left doing the NFL to start coaching guys how to jump out of airplanes. He's like, cause these guys are present and they are dialed in and the consequences are real. And he said, I wanted to learn from them how they get their minds so dialed in. And I feel like Laird, because he's a big wave surfer and he is in a, a, an environment of extreme consequence that he can apply all that to his regular life where when he's talking to you 30 seconds and you're like, I just, that's full attention. I'm good. Yeah. Well, it's that. And it's also growing up a white kid in Wainiha Valley and Hawaii. <laughs> You better pay attention <laughs> what's going on. And I think that's Laird's main motto. He always says like during COVID, he's like, people have got to pay attention. When you drive your car, pay attention. Like right. look around, know what's going on in nature, right? Like we're, we're losing our naturalness of like, what is my surroundings? What's happening tonally? What is this person's body language and their voice? And so I think it's, Yes, it is certainly that environment, but it is the way he grew up. And it's, it's the way that anyone who understands that things can happen like this, um, we should pay attention. Yeah. And I feel like uh, just when I mean, you, you both grew up on islands and that you guys probably have such an appreciation for being outside and what kind of real natural beauty looks like. And I love the way you described it, how you have to sort of coach your daughter through an artificial life you know, instead of what's going on in the real world, how, and you've mentioned a lot that you and Laird have similar values, both growing up on islands, but I feel like, especially now with COVID that we were all stuck inside for so long that an appreciation for the outdoors is just so important now, even more than ever. Yeah, I think, well, because even though our technology has changed so drastically since 2007, 2008, our physiology and our biology really hasn't. Right. So what really makes us feel good are still the same things and but those take effort and they they happen slowly right like when you look and you go out in nature everything's happening at a tempo that's slow because that's actually what's good for us yeah but um the tricky thing is the phone is so fast active and moving and exciting and click 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 so i think our kids brains are getting hardwired accordingly where the other is almost like torture now yeah, but that sense of well-being and calm, or if we talk about peace or not having anxiety, that comes from being connected to that natural self. Um, and, and that's the thing. How do you teach kids that without it being woo woo? And like, it's so precious. Look at the sunset. It's like, how do you make it sort of just like a very regular part of their life and that they intuitively understand, huh, that makes me feel good. And they learn how to seek it out for themselves. Yeah. I feel like, Try, you're doing a good job with that. Naya is, she's a, a water bug, Gabby. She's like constantly just charging around the beach naked, <laughs> getting in the water. And... <laughs> well, when you, I know when you raise a kid around water, um, you know, and, I'm, and she sees me going in, which I've learned I can't force her. Because if, if I make her wipe out once, then she doesn't want to do it for a week, you know. So I'm, I'm just kind of trying to show her uh, how to do it. But she doesn't like the water here in Cali. Like we go to Hawaii, she's obsessed. And then she's yelling, I want to go swim, dad. Or try now. <laughs> and, uh, and then I put her feet in and she freaks out over here. So she, she's definitely excited to get back to warm water. Nobody, nobody hates warm water. Oh, my God. Yeah. No. So bad. I, I wear the full 4-3 wetsuits at all times. Like. Everyone else is like, you're going to be too hot. I'm like, I will not be too hot. Trust me. <laughs> Gloves, booties, everything. Uh, Gabby, before we let you go, I wanted to touch base a little bit on the XPT training. Um, I'm stoked that I got the invite to go uh, 
to go check it out. I'm really excited about it. But um, what, yeah, what do you guys got going on up there with the XPT, which stands for Extreme Performance Training? You know, XPT was just born out of um, our natural lifestyle. And there was a volleyball player who's my very dear friend, Jennifer Meredith um, Castillo. And I, we sort of, we were roommates and uh, we played kind of around each other. We actually never really on a team too much, but we've been, you know, friends. She played at Pepperdine and, um, then played on the beach, but Jen was like, oh, you have to put this together and share it with people. And I was like, what value could this possibly, what could we do? So she put together these, these events, these two and a half day events. And what it did is 14 years ago, Laird started and using us as crash test dummies, messing around in the pool and in an effort, because he doesn't like just lap swimming. Um, and out of that came this idea of breathe, move and recover because breathing it's, pretty essential. And if you talk about performance and recovery, it's, it's really important. I love the fact that it's free and you can do it anywhere. Mm. And most of us do it incorrectly, just natural because of our, our, the, you know, the, our lifestyles and such. Um, and then moving a natural amount of movement and then recovery. I think for Laird, um, that's where the heat and ice came in because it was sort of like really not only like, oh, it's my day off, but like participating in uh, supporting your recovery. So it could be stretching or, you know, heat or ice or whatever people do that kind of helps them recover faster or an accelerated rate. And then the pool training is very unique. You'll experience it um, on Saturday. But what I love about the pool training is you can do hypoxic training, cardio training, ballistic training. You will be tired. It could, it can improve your um, performance, but you're not beat up. And so when you go to practice, you're already jumping how many times in a practice and then you play in a competition and how many over the weekend. So I can get you, I can jump, you can jump hundred, 400 times in my pool. And now I haven't jammed on your joints, but I maybe I'm supporting your performance. Yeah. Um, your in compression. So your lymphatic system is in it, you know, working differently. You can be hypoxic. So there's a lot of things where you can do more with less air. You can become more efficient. The organism, the athlete can become more efficient. Um, so there's some real scientific and interesting things. Um, not to mention it is an environment because there is some of the time, no air where you really see yourself mm. or you go, Oh, I kind of freaked out. And um, so you can bring all of that onto the court or field and, um, I think it's, I think it's really, um, I believe that all your training should help you just be a more efficient organism, how you want to do that. Volleyball, football, life, business relationships. That's on you. I'm stoked. I'm so excited. You, are you bringing I, anyone? Say are, you, that again? are you bringing anyone? Or are you coming solo? Well, I was going to bring someone to film, but, um, I, maybe my guy, uh, Travis here. I, I took Travis surfing the other day and he was just charging. I was like, maybe, maybe don't take off on that wave. And he's like, it's just water. I was like, <laughs> yeah, we'll see. <laughs> maybe Travis needs a little bit of that training. <laughs> I like it. It's really, it's really good. And, and um, listen, I've had people come in here that guys, NBA guys that really aren't exposed to water and they're mm -hmm. not even particularly comfortable or can swim. They are jumpers though. So it's like, we know we can put everybody in an environment. You guys will be great, but in an environment that they can be successful. Um, it's yeah. It's really interesting actually. Wait, yeah. Travis, you're going to make it Travis. I'm on board Saturday. Maybe we can go surf Malibu while we're at it. I'm in, <laughs> you, you know, I'm not scared to go down. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm a terrible surfer gabby ignorance is bliss you know that's the thing when you don't know sometimes what can really happen because it doesn't take a particularly large wave to really create some damage yeah yeah right enjoy that you know <laughs> yeah. yeah mother nature will uh will will scare scare a little uh she'll humble me soon enough that out you real quick <laughs> yeah, no joke. love it but that was awesome yeah. Well, Gabby, thank you tons uh, for taking the time. I know that you're, you're crazy busy being a parent and uh, with the company and, and everything else you got going on. I know you do uh, a bunch of shows and have a podcast of your own. Um, before we let you go, though, where can our listeners find you and, and all the things that you're doing? Um, well, my podcast is very originally titled. It's the Gabby Reese Show. And um, I'm on Instagram at Gabby Reese. And um, yeah, and I really appreciate, you know, like I said, volleyball, um, volleyball 
was a really important event um, and, and sort of place for me to, to grow up and to learn and to come across great athletes and great coaches. And um, I think it's for me was like, when they say what sport is really about, you know, it's like, how does it make you, how does it enrich your whole life? Mm. And um, it, it certainly did that. So I, I appreciate just, you know, it's always still fun to talk about it. And, and uh, I, I never particularly enjoyed like traveling on the weekends and then see guys do this easier. This is one very funny part about volleyball. Guys can be like, uh, like curse at each other on the court. You see them later. And then their hotel lobby together. And you're like, what's up? Chicks don't do that. Right. Like, <laughs> It's so everything's so personal and intense and heavy. And I think that part of it all kicked my ass in a real way because it was like, oh, you know, it's like every, you know, they're all in the players' tent. It's just like, oh, you know. So yeah. that part was so interesting for me. Uh, because it is interesting. I have a theory that women have to ramp up to be that competitive and almost go into their masculine, where guys can flip it like a switch. Uh. And uh, also they learn uh, not to take things personally, right? And so um, I always thought I would wish I could have been who I am today more when I competed because, you know, you learn that. Yeah. Certainly. Yeah, well, today's guys are taking it sensitive nowadays too. <laughs> it's getting soft uh, in the player stand. <laughs> not on my team. <laughs> not on your team. <laughs> I would see guys literally swear and go if you said and they're like together whatever and you're just like oh that looks so amazing yeah no it's uh that I I definitely see that when we, we've talked about it before too with with some of the girls and we're uh I don't know I I couldn't I couldn't handle it any other way like I have to get intense on the court and have to want to kill you yeah but then I'm just like, I don't need this drama. Like, I really don't care about yeah. the volleyball game's over. <laughs> and, and it's just so awkward. Like, we had a, we actually have talked about it where my first Olympic quad against Casey Patterson, Jake Gibb, uh, those guys, it was so awkward. Like, dinners were all separate. And we're, because we're completing for that spot. <laughs> and, and this time around, it was like, we all kind of like, we're over it. And it was like, that was really uncomfortable. It's just compete and then <laughs> be over it. Yeah. But yeah, it is. You know. it, it's just a fast. That was always a fascinating element for me. And I was always like, I just, you know, like, <laughs> so it's so draining. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was. Yeah, I might have played longer, actually, but. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Well, we, we love the, keeping you involved in the volleyball community and um, kind of reintroducing you to the to the younger community that's coming in now and uh yeah it's been a pleasure and i'm super awesome. stoked to get in the water up at, at your you. house yeah that's my home address nice and uh yeah do you know carrie walsh doesn't know this but her playing actually kept my part of my volleyball life alive years longer because everyone was like oh it's <laughs> tall blonde like uh, and, and then like i and i just like yeah that's carrie walsh that's <laughs> oh, yeah <laughs> That's awesome. Never, never. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Well, we're excited. I'm exci really excited to hear the uh, April Ross episode come out on your podcast. When does that uh, drop? I think it's out in two weeks. Yeah, two she's, weeks. she's she's intense. She's intense, for yeah. sure. You know what I like? I was sitting across from her, and I was when we were doing the interview. I mean, I like many things, but I was looking at her, and I go, you know what I just realized about you? Because I don't really know April, you know? Um I go, you have, you, you know, you don't have any chick female drama. I can, I just know. And she's like, oh, she's like, she says, she walks up and she's like, what are you guys talking about? No. And then walks away. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I'm like, that's the way to be. Yeah. I feel like also, could, she's yeah. 40. So that's the thing is the art of when you finally go, I, I'm going to tell you how I feel it's okay. Like it's, it's, it's all part of the deal. And, and I think that that's so beautiful to watch, to see her now she's there. Um, she probably got there a lot sooner than a lot of other female athletes um, and healthy and excited about playing. It's like right on, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's really cool. Yeah. 
Yeah. You want to talk about an athlete who has that sort of layered laser focus. April's one of them. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. Just yeah. here it is. Okay. So yeah. And, and uh, whatever you wear, just wear shorts that, you know, will stay on. <laughs> oh, no uh, scruffy waist brands. No squinchy waist bands. Don't get European on me. Bring your like tie something. <laughs> board shorts, real board shorts. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Well, thanks. And I'll see you. I'll see you Saturday. Nice. Love it. Sounds thanks, good. Gabby. Aloha. Thanks, Gabby. Bye. Aloha. Shoots. Shoots. <laughs>